GearNetwork.com. The following is a presentation of the Gear Radio Network. This is AC Slade, and you're listening to the All Bets Are Off podcast with Robbie Vegas. What's up, Rock Soldiers? This is the Rockstar Robbie Vegas bringing you another episode of the All Bets Are Off podcast. And today we have another horror-filled episode with Russell Todd. You may remember Russell from Friday the 13th 2 and from Chopping Mall, but he's done a hell of a lot of other things that we're going to dive into today as well. So super stoked about it. I love Chopping Mall. It's one of my favorite 80s slashers. Who doesn't love killer robots, right? So before we bring you Russell, I do need to let you know that today's episode is sponsored by Relief Factor. Pain from everyday living, exercise, or just getting older is one of the leading causes of trips to the doctor and sleepless nights. It interferes with daily activities and could even keep us from spending time with the people we love. If you have everyday pain, it stands to reason you need something you can feel comfortable with taking every day. That's why doctors invented 100% drug-free relief factor. Now, tens of thousands of customers are using relief factor every day to become mostly or completely pain-free. 100% drug-free relief factor features four key ingredients that each work on a different metabolic pathway to support your body's natural healing processes to respond to pain and inflammation. Now you can try relief factor too. The three-week quick start, retail price of almost $70, is now available to our listeners for just $19.95. Head to the link in our show notes to find out more and start your journey to better health and less pain today with relief factor. All right, guys, so make sure you check that out as always. You've noticed that we've been putting links to all of our sponsors in the show notes, whether you're listening on Spotify or Apple Podcast or however you get your podcast. Go in and check those out every single week. Of course, they help the show. And you know what else helps the show? Checking out my Pro Wrestling Tea store and grabbing yourself a Robbie Vegas tea. Maybe you want to support my music. There's Angels and Demons, my my EP. So you could check out that t-shirt. And they all come in fitted, women's, men's, whatever you want. It's there at Pro Wrestling Tees. Just search Rockstar Robbie Vegas, and you can even get ABAO Pod t-shirts. So check out that All Bets Are Off t-shirt, too, if you're just a fan of the show. So let's get Russell on the phone and talk some horror movies. So, Russell, thank you for being on the All Bets Are Off podcast. I truly appreciate it, man. It's my pleasure being here, Robbie. Thank you very much for asking me. Not a problem. So, I kind of want to take this back pretty far here, and I want to know how old you were when you discovered that you actually had an interest in acting. Well, it's funny. I always wanted to be a film director since I was probably eight years old. I used to make Super 8 movies on the floor of my kitchen. I I laid a map out, and I put a little toy car in in New York, one in California, and I would do stop motion, and they would meet somewhere in the the middle of the country, and when they hit, they exploded. And that was my first film I ever made. (laughs) That's excellent. (laughs) And there was lighter fluid on them for that last shot. When the fire happened, little did I know I was burning the linoleum on the floor. parents weren't too happy about that but then i went to college and i studied acting and film at syracuse university um, years later but i ended up working one summer at universal studios just as a tour guide and people kept i was giving the tours and people kept saying are you an actor you should be an actor and i said uh, no i mean i'd love to be but you know i'm not currently and uh, so i got some headshots and then uh, i started getting work i started getting commercials and and acting gigs and that's where it began do you remember what some of your first commercials were well the very first commercial i it was back in new york i went back to new york it was for a department store that's no longer around called called corvettes did you ever hear of that i have not it was like a, a Kmart type of thing, uh, you know, three Korean veterans put it together, and it was called Corvettes, but they were all over, as far as I know, the East Coast. But the funny thing about the audition for that is I knew I had to be in shorts during the actual commercial, so I showed up in shorts, but I have a little scar uh, just above my left knee, and I thought, well, if I'm going to be in shorts, I don't want them to see that scar, so... I got to the audition, and before I went in, I, excuse, I went to the bathroom, and I took some crazy glue, 
and the scissors, and I cut some hair from the rest of my leg, and I put the crazy glue on the scar, and I tapped the hair on there, and I said, man, that's great. It looks, you can't even see it. It's fantastic. <laughs> so I away, and I went back out, and, and I sat waiting to get called in for the audition. I must have sat there for 45 minutes. So they bring me in, and they say, okay, remove your, I had sweatpants on top of the shorts. Remove your sweatpants, and and let me show you, you know, show us your legs and your shorts. And as I did that, I could see them just like staring at my leg. I'm thinking, what the hell's going on? And I looked down, and all that time waiting, the crazy glue had dried this super, like, bright white. <laughs> <laughs> So I explained to them what I had done to get the spot. They said, you know what? I don't care. You're in. You got the job. Come on, really? <laughs> so it's a great first you know, thing. And, you know, and in the spot, I say, and look at my Terry sportswear. Look at my Terry sportswear. And, and I jump up in the air and I come down and I'm all of a sudden you know, in this Terry outfit, which was maybe very big in the 80s or something. <laughs> That was my first spot, and that um, I believe that got me into the union. I was tapped heartily into it after that. But um, I've done lots of commercials. The very I'll tell you the very last one I did, if you're interested. Yes, absolutely. Which was a cool one with Sharon Stone. Really? Um, and in fact, if, any, if anyone wants to Google it, just Google Sharon Stone and the word scotch, like the drink. Mm -hmm. And it was for William Lawson Scotch. And it never showed in America, of course, but around the rest of the world. And it was a takeoff on, um, the name's, what's the, the, the movie where she uncrosses her leg? It's going to bother God. me now. Uh. So it's, uh, it's such a well-known movie, and I've yeah. been saying it for years, and now I can't, now it's, it's out of my head. Instinct, basic instinct. Yes, yeah. Uh, so in the, in the commercial, um, we're all dressed, uh, she, uh, an elevator door opens and she's looking amazing. And I'm in the, in the elevator with her. We're all both dressed up. I'm in, a, I'm in a tuxedo. And there's a guy walking by the elevator who's like in a kilt without a shirt. And, you know, a, a good-looking guy. So she looks at him. And I'm looking at her like, hey, I'm your date. Stop looking at him. <laughs> and walk out. And she keeps looking at him. He keeps looking at her. She sits down on the couch. He sits down on a chair next to her and crosses his legs. His legs are crossed. And I'm getting something at the front desk. I come back. I sit down. I just give him the dirty eye, the evil eye. Like, you know, who are you? And. <laughs> And he looks at me, and he, in slow motion, uncrosses his legs, and he has nothing on underneath, and he does it to me. <laughs> <laughs> and Sharon Stone looks and just laughs hysterically. It's a great spot. And then it says, William Lawson Scotch. But uh, that's the very last commercial I did, and, and she chose me for her, which was cool out of the audition. That's excellent. I'm going to have to look that up and link it to this uh, this episode so people could watch yeah. that when they're listening. <laughs> under uh, Sharon Stone and the word scotch it'll, it'll pop up it's a black and white spot awesome I'll definitely check that out so was your first uh, movie that you made was that the slasher from 1980 he knows you're alone that was yeah I uh, auditioned for that and um, it cast me right away for that I mean I'm basically in the film you know for a couple of minutes I'm the very opening scene and uh, and then you learn it's a movie within a movie but uh What's very funny is I get killed the exact same way, you know, kind of a slit throat and hanging upside down, which is bizarre. <laughs> it's it, uh, and Friday the 13th Part 2, but that was my first uh, film and Tom Hanks' first movie I booked. But uh, he did a little better than I did. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I wanted to ask you, so since that was your first film, were you already a fan of horror movies or the horror genre? Or was that something that just kind of like you stumbled into? No, I think I, I already liked them. But, but I couldn't specifically name anything at that point because I was, what it was my age. I was 21 or something, 22, mm -hmm. 23. And um, I don't even remember what was out at that time. But I remember going to the theater and seeing horror films. I did enjoy them. And then, of course, I saw the very first Friday the 13th that came out and... and, and was scared like everyone else and, and loved it. So when I had the chance to audition for the second one, I thought, well, this is really cool to do a sequel. And, uh, and to get cast in it was very exciting. That had to be a really cool feeling for you just because you did enjoy the first one. So what was it like when you actually were like on the set? Where it, Was it one of those feelings where it's like, man, this is going to be huge? Or were you just having a good time? Well, we didn't know. You never know when you're making something. But we knew the first one was big. And, you know, big enough to put the money in to make a second. So, but I knew we were a, a fun group of guys and girls together and we enjoyed each other's company. And, you know, we had a good process and a lot of fun making it. So we thought it was going to be 
uh, a good film, but you just have no idea. And, you know, it was the beginning of the franchise, only the second one. So, I mean, you just, there's no way to know. And, to, you know, the legs it's had and how many, you know, sequels, tangents and things, it's, it's just amazing. And now to think back how we weren't naive, we were, we were hopeful that it would do well. Um, but you just don't know when you're making it. And it was only number two. But now, you know, we look back and go, wow, it's just it's amazing what it's done. Yeah, I mean, you're a part of probably the biggest horror franchise in history. And Jason is probably the most recognizable killer in the franchises, I would think. Yeah, so what, I think so, too. Now, what was it like? Because you mentioned that you you died the same way in the in your first two movies. Is that a tough scene to film when you're when you're filming that death scene and you have to have the the throat slip but you're hanging upside down? Well, the toughest part was the upside down, and I mean, we knew we wanted to get it in one take because there was a lot of blood involved. And my friend John Caglione is the one that did the prosthetic makeup on me. He, you know, preset a, a latex piece across my throat. With a, mm -hmm. It was pre cut, and then there was the the tubing going through it down. You know, I'm upside down, so it's going down my shirt down my pants and coming out at my foot and there's someone up in the tree where it's, it's this tubing is connected to a, you know, a pump tank and on, on cue they're, they're pumping away. But we knew we wanted to get it in one take because of the bloody mess it was going to make and uh, and we were lucky we did but, uh, you know, they, they hung me upside down but, you know, someone from the crew would, would hold my back up so I wasn't totally upside down but I was there probably 45 minutes to an hour, I believe, um, you know, in prep and stuff. Oh, wow. And uh, maybe maybe forty five minutes max, and um, and we talked about it and what the reaction would be, which you know, not you know, we we can all act what it's like, but we don't, you know, thank God none of us know, and uh, so we're, we're we're acting like we've just been attacked that way. But uh, luckily, we got it in one take. But I remember the blood, and I guess the footage exists, but the censors said it couldn't be put in the movie where the blood goes really, you know, it becomes gross and there's so much blood coming out and it starts running into my eyes. And at that point we had to cut because it was, I had to get, you know, the blood out of my eyes. It was, it was painful. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. But, um, yeah, we got in the one take and uh, it seems to have worked fine. So this year is actually the 40th anniversary of Friday the 13th Part 2. And I know they released like a new Blu-ray and extended cuts and all that. And the film now in 2021 seems to be even more popular than it's ever been. Have you noticed that? Yeah, it's wild. I mean, all these years later, I, I still get lots of fan mail, people requesting photos from it and signatures. And when I go, I, I haven't done many in the last four or five years, many of the uh, fan conventions. Mm -hmm. But uh, the last one I did, I think, was a, was an anniversary as well. And a lot of us from the cast were there. And I couldn't believe how many people showed up to wait in line to see us. It was, it was truly amazing. It was really great. But I can sense, based on the fan mail and, you know, the number of people that asked to talk to me, uh, that it's still, you know, it's still right up there and it still means something to people, which is just great. Right? All yeah. these years, it's just, it still has a, a voice and, uh, and power. I know a lot of people who say that the second one is the best one of the franchise, and it's the first one where, you know, Jason is actually the killer, so it's a really important movie in the series. Yeah, I've heard that too, for the same reasons exactly. They enjoy it the most, uh, and I think wh what you said was the main reason, and then hopefully they you know, just enjoy the story and, and us as well, I hope. But uh, yeah, it's great to hear that when, they, when people say, you know, that is, is my favorite. When you were actually filming Friday the 13th, did you have a hard time dropping into character and like playing that scared, you know, person? Or was it more natural because when you see, you know, a guy coming at you with weapons and, you know, a sack over his head, it comes naturally to you to be scared regardless of whether you're filming a movie or not? Right. Well, that would be, yes, without a doubt, the, the latter would be scary. <laughs> uh, but, you know, Scott is a wise ass in the film and, you know, it's, it's easy and fun to play a, a wise ass. And womanizer and, and you know he's he's a good guy but you know he's just a typical wise ass he's around uh, terry and uh so it wasn't difficult to play but uh it, it was it was something i enjoyed doing very much so after friday the 13th you're in a movie called where the boys are and yes. i was just saying it was a remake of a 1961 or 64 I forget the original with uh, Connie Francis, Yvette Mugu, George Hamilton. I forget who else was in the original. Really? I did, I did not know that. Yeah. 
Okay, very cool. So in that movie, you play like a, a rocker kind of guy, and it was a totally different genre going from, you know, your first two movies, which are both in the horror genre, to that. So did you find it now difficult to switch gears and play a different role, or did you feel that your character was kind of along the same lines? There were some similarities. He's a bit of a wise-ass too and womanizer, but... It was the first role where I had truly the lead in a movie, mm-hmm. so there was a lot more pressure on me, uh, and I did feel that. I mean, I was cast in that, and all of a sudden, uh, you know, I was cast in L.A., and then the whole cast, we ended up in Florida, you know, and and doing a remake of a film, and I played the Tim Hutton, Tim Hutton's dad, the actor Tim Hutton, his father, I think it was Jim Hutton, mm-hmm. I played his role, and I got picked up by the girls hitchhiking in Florida, and then, you know, fall in love with the one, the least Hartman character, uh, and then serenader with this you know song at the very end of the movie so there was a lot of there was a lot of pressure i the the, the performance aspect at the end um and and starring in a movie with a few other people so that part was very different from friday the 13th part two and so and other things i had done but i loved the challenge and uh and once again i was you know i was grateful they selected for that now, for that uh, movie specifically, I know you said you haven't done um, many cons, but do you ever find people who come to those cons and want you to autograph something from where the boys are? Yeah, yeah, from a lot of things, from that, from, although those cons are mostly horror, some of the people say, well, I remember you as Dr. Jamie Frame on Another World, I did that for three years, mm-hmm. they'll remember where the boys are, uh, another one, Chopping Mall, which is a, you know, a cult picture now that, um was a Roger Corman produced project. Actually, his wife Julie Corman I think, produced it. Okay, um, but uh, that one still—I mean, it still sells out at midnight shows, and and people ask a lot about that and the request to autograph some pictures from that one too. Well, that's actually my next question because that's one of my favorite movies of all time. Oh, that's right. <laughs> so I was trying to like hold back on oh, jumping on you that one. Me into it, and I pulled it up too quickly. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. It worked out perfect. So. Chopping Mall had to be a wild movie to make because you're you're making a movie in a mall about killer robots, but in the 80s. And that had to be just like a wild ride. Did, did you have like a blast making that movie or what? It was so much fun. Here we are, a bunch of young guys and girls running around a mall when it closed. So we would get in there around 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock at night and destroy it till 7 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and, you know, we had, you know you know, 8K-47s and handguns and we had flamethrower kind of things. I, I break into a sports shop by throwing a, a crowbar through the window and destroying it and explodes. <laughs> um, it was like, you know, I did a Western once too and it was like being in a Western where, uh, you know, things that you've seen so often yourself on screen and now you're having the chance to, you know, play the action hero and, and have some fun doing it. But we had a blast doing that. I mean, the Galleria was really close to my home, the Sherman Oaks Gallery, and it was known from some other movies prior to that. So I had gone there quite often shopping, and here I am now, you know, wreaking havoc in it and trying to stay alive through the night. (laughs) What was, like, running through your mind when you first read the script? Were you like, I have to be in this movie, or were you kind of like, man, how's this really going to (laughs) go? I thought it was just very different because, you know, robots attacking us, and the chance to be, you know, a, kind of an action hero in it, even though I don't survive, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so I definitely wanted to be in it. And I'm so glad that Jim Minorsky and Steve Mitchell, uh, Jim, the director, and Steve, the writer, uh, had seen me, I believe, in Where the Boys Are and, and asked me to, to audition to be in it. So uh, that worked out great. Okay, so now <laughs> that's another... Technically another slasher, even though they are robots, it is considered an 80s slasher. And yes. that's another one that I think now, in 2021, might be more popular than it was in the 80s. Remarkably. It's, it's again, it, I mean, it's still showing at midnight showings. We did a midnight showing and and, and, and question and answer and, and, and signing in L.A. Maybe it was last year. And the thing just sold out. It was at the Egyptian in Hollywood. And people stop me and say, aren't you in that movie where, uh, you know, Chopping Wall, also known as Killbots? And, and they love it. They say it's one of their, like you, one of their favorite movies. And uh, and Jim and Steve did a terrific job with it. it, 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 it it's fun. It's kitschy. It's exciting. It's, it, it's entertaining. And, um, and at one point I heard they were going to try to do a TV series based on it, which I really hope happens sometime. Oh, wow. Of course, we're dead or whatever. But, you know, I always think, including in Friday the 13th, I wish they would do this, that we come back as the parents of ourselves because we look exactly like the kid. <laughs> oh, that would be fantastic. <laughs> you know, we have to go back to the site 
to find closure, and then something else horrific happens to us. But um, I think that would be a great idea for Friday the 13th or for uh, Chopping Mall. Now, with those two movies, um, would you say that you enjoyed shooting one more than the other, or was was it just, just two completely separate experiences for you? Mm, I mean, they are very different, and also very different, you know, different times in my life. I was younger. Mm-hmm. So they were, they were very different, because one I last also a lot longer in the picture, which is nice in Chopping Wall than I did in Friday 2. But um, they're just, they're very different uh, experiences. And uh, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say one was better than the other. Would you say that it was a little bit um, different too? Because with Friday the 13th, a lot of the stuff that's going on, you're obviously outside and, you know, you have the elements and, you know, things to combat with as far as, you know, shooting the movie goes. But in Chopping Mall, since you're inside, was it easier to like, you know, set up for the next shot or, you know, stay in character or, you know, anything like that? Well, on both of those, I mean, when, when they yell cut, they're, you know, it's not a heavy drama piece, as we know. <laughs> so, you don't really need to stay in character until your next shot. You can easily get back into it for those kind of roles. Mm-hmm. Um, but there is a big difference between shooting, a, you know, an entire interior than being outside uh, and and having the elements there, and there's something to be said for both. It's it's great when you're outside and you feel the wind and you you know you f- you feel the sun on you, and those things add to to your what you're feeling at that moment. I think it, it's very important. And when you're inside, you've got different things. You've got the way the lighting, not not the set lighting, but the actual lighting of the mall in this instance hits you, and and what you feel about being in closed space, closed air. So those things play you know a, a small a role in it. But um, do I prefer one over the other? Not really. Okay, okay. So I did want to ask you about um, some of the TV that you've done, because I know over the years with more movies and more television, for a while there, you were actually cast on uh, The Young and the Restless. How did that come about? Well, uh, Don Diamant, who played Brad, he in real life had got meningitis. So they, I didn't know, just they just called me uh, to come in and replace him for whatever amount of time it might be. And they didn't even know if he was going to survive, quite honestly, because people can die from meningitis. Right. And so I got called in, and the funny part about that appearance on that show was, you know, it was at CBS Television City on Melrose and Beverly Boulevard here in Hollywood. And when I would show up at the... After my uh, episode started airing, and they saw it wasn't Don Diamant anymore, who was one of the most popular characters, not only on that show, but I think in daytime you know, TV. Mm-hmm. And... So when they start seeing Russell Todd appearing and, and Don was not there, when I would show up at the studio, there were fans there, and when I would leave the studio, and they were like, we don't want you, we don't like you, bring back Brad, bring back Don. I mean, they were, they were abusive, some of them. Wow. <laughs> and I said, I, I said, I'm only playing a role, but it's for a limited time. You know, it's not my choice. <laughs> I was hired to do this. But then he eventually, thank God, got well, because I knew Don, he was a good guy, I'm glad he got well. So he came back, but I, I forget how long I was there, but it was uh, it was a short amount of time, but uh, I took a lot of abuse from that fan. <laughs> <laughs> now, do you find it um, more difficult to do things like soap operas and things like that as opposed to film? Well, it's a very different process. You're there doing, you know, so many pages, I mean, you know, 60 pages a day, or whatever it is, and, and you're memorizing like crazy, and... I know in Young and the Restless and other shows over at CBS, some of them, they, they're allowed to use cue cards and teleprompters. I did Another World and NBC Soap for three years playing Dr. Jamie Frame, and you had to memorize everything. Mm-hmm. And that meant a lot of work. I mean, you spent so much time memorizing that script. I carry it with me, you know, everywhere I went. Even when I was sitting in the bathroom, I'm memorizing the script because you had to be up and ready for the next day. And you got the script a few days before. But, uh, so it's a little different than, than making a movie where you're doing just a few pages a day. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's also a wonderful place if you're on it for two or three years. I was on for three years to, to hone your craft because you're acting every day. You're, you're literally working 50 weeks a year. You get two weeks off for your character. Mm-hmm. And often you have to put in for those weeks months and months in advance because they have to have leeway, you know, time to, to write you out of the story for whatever reason. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So through the years, as like you know, your acting career kept going on and on. Did you get to a point where it was no longer auditioning? Like you said, they just kind of called you for the Young and the Restless. Was that starting to happen more frequently as you know you got into the '90s and TV and things like that? It happened only a few times where they did that uh, in, in in TV. Although in commercials, I auditioned, but a lot of commercials I got called in and uh, called just to be booked, which was wonderful. They were always the bread and butter. And, uh, I did, you know, over a hundred 
national commercials and love doing them. It was they're, they're a lot of fun and it's it, it's it's quick. It's one, two, three days and, and terrific money, which is nice. Over uh, over one hundred, you said. Over a hundred commercials, yeah. Oh my god, that's a lot! Wow. The years, yeah. So um, that was a lot of fun to do. But it was funny, you, you know, breakdowns, which list projects and then who's involved and the casting directors get them and there was one project i'll never forget it i have it somewhere there was a breakdown that said we're looking for a russell todd type i thought wow that's bizarre that's wild why don't they hire me (laughs) but they didn't want me they wanted my type it was bizarre (laughs) so they wanted your type but they didn't want you yeah all right (laughs) so i did a couple like I said, that we're just, they called me into it, which is, which is great. Now, before the pandemic and all that stuff, did you have any upcoming conventions and stuff that, that got canceled? Because I know with it being the 40 year anniversary, I, I'm just assuming that they were starting to pop up right around that time. I believe there was one, but I, I don't recall if it was set. I have two others. One I, I was just asked to do, one I can't make mm-hmm. in the South, but I will be appearing in Chicago sometime in November, I don't have a date in front of me, to do a convention. And they're going to try to bring a number of people in for the Fridays, for, at least for my Friday. But uh, yeah, that's supposed to happen in November in Chicago. I'm sure that someone could Google that and find exact dates. That's got to be such a wild ride to go to these conventions and see all the chopping mall on Friday the 13th and all those fans coming out and asking you questions and getting everything signed from movies that were made 40 years ago. I know, it, it's truly amazing. And I got to say, I mean, I always thought soap fans, and they are, incredibly devoted to the actors on them because you're in their living room, you know, 52 weeks a year. So they feel like they know you, they can ask you anything right up to you. But slasher horror fans are equally, maybe even more devoted. And it, it's such a niche and people just, you know, they just they attach to it and just love. I mean, most people love being scared and, uh, and, and love the effects that they, that these films have. And uh, when you meet all these people, at conventions, it's it's really fantastic because you get to share, you know, tell their stories about what they liked about the movie, what they liked about you, and how you know it's affected their lives. And it's always great that that it has that uh, power with anyone. So, would you ever consider doing another slasher now? Yeah, I would. You know, if someone came to me and asked me to act again, I would definitely do that. Depending on the project, of course. Right. But, <laughs> yes, not anything. But uh, it's been a while. I've had my business now you know i'm an entertainment agent i represent steady chem operators and i've had that now my own company about 21 years so that's oh, where wow. my where my interest has been for for all that time and i love what i do what i'm doing but if someone came to me and offered me another acting job i would definitely consider it now do you keep up with the genre at all and like you know still watch the new horror movies that are coming out and things like that or did you find that you you kind of fell out of it no i, I watch some of them you know, I, I will say, though, that I only saw a couple in the series of Friday the 13th. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, the whole list of them. But uh, but if something's cool and it gets you know, great reviews, uh, or one of my clients shoots, some of my clients shoot a lot of the well-known horror films, then I'll, then I'll definitely catch it. So I have one more chopping mall question for you. <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> what, what did you think when you first saw the Killbots? Oh, I thought they were cool. Yeah, I they were. They were well designed, and I loved that they had you know their their, their clipping hands that could get you, and, and the tasers that you could shoot out, and the lasers. So there was a lot going on with them, and um, and the way they moved it was cool. Yeah, I thought they were well conceived, and people seemed to really gravitate toward them. I gotta say, like they might be one of my favorite slasher killers. I, I love them. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Well, you're not alone. They're not alone. I know. And you know, for the longest time, I would tell people like, have you ever seen this movie? And they'd be like, what the hell are you talking about? And now everybody's like, yeah, I just got the t-shirt. Like, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> there's, there's, there's a number of things. I've got a mug. There's, I have a t-shirt. I even have a, uh, like a little wallet case that's metal that opens up that the front of it is the, is the poster. Um, so things are, things are getting made out there. People are enjoying it. That's so awesome to hear, because that movie definitely deserves it. It's so much fun. It is, it is. <laughs> so before I let you go, I just want you to take the time now to just let people know where they could follow you on social media, or if you have a website or anything like that, or just where they can keep up with you in case you uh, do do some more conventions and they want to come out and meet you. That's great. That's terrific. Well, the only thing I really have is Instagram, and um, it's just under uh, Russell Todd LA. 
my name, L.A., Russell Todd, L.A. And it's not open to the public yet. I'm waiting a little to do that. Uh, but if people send a notice, I confirm them. So don't worry about that. People get confirmed. But I just, I'm waiting till I kind of transition from what I'm doing now to uh, to maybe retirement. <laughs> um, <laughs> And then I'll devote more time to it, and and who knows, maybe parlay it into something else or do some more acting later. But uh, if they want to catch me, that's that's the place to do it. Russell Todd LA on Instagram. Well, awesome. Thank you again for being here and uh, letting me bombard you with chopping mall questions because I'm uh, such a big it, fan. I'm glad you enjoyed it. I appreciate it very much. It was really nice talking with you, Robin. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you again, and have a good night. Thank you. You too. All right, Rockers. So once again, that was Russell Todd, Chopping Mall, Friday the 13th, a bunch of other things. So just go through his catalog, check out what he's done. He's very good. And I said it a bunch during the podcast. I'll say it now. Chopping Mall is one of my favorite movies and it's just so much fun. And it's an 80 slasher with robots. It doesn't get more fun or more 80s than that. So thank you guys for checking us out. And don't forget to check out deathcomeslifting.com for all your lifting needs, for the fitness, for the misfits. We got punk rock, heavy metal, horror movies, all merged together for a healthy lifestyle. So make sure you check them out and support the people that support us. And follow us on social media at ABAOPod, and we will see you next week. The preceding presentation has been brought to you by the Gear Network.